Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's live webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started as our attendees continue to roll in. So welcome to our webinar on injection molding design strategies and uh, on the Zometry Injection Molding Service. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Serena. I'm on the marketing team here at Zometry. And here are a couple of other quick notes. Please submit your questions throughout the webinar. Um, we will be monitoring the question box throughout and we will answer them during our Q&A session at the end. After the webinar, we'll send you a webinar recording to rewatch or share with your colleagues. So look out for that email and stick around also for a special discount on your first injection molding order. Um, so with that, uh, let's pass it over to Greg and Kira. I'll introduce them. So Greg Paulson is your first presenter. He is our Director of Application Engineering at Zometry. He has spent over a decade working with engineers on custom manufacturing projects using CNC machining, additive manufacturing, sheet metal, urethane casting, and most importantly here, injection molding. Prior to Zometry, Greg worked in product development with a focus on ruggedized electromechanical systems. Next up, we have Kira Stawson. Kira is our technical sales engineer for the injection molding division here at Zometry. She graduated from Penn State Barrand with a degree in plastics engineering and has a background in automotive manufacturing. Her passion lies in stage design of injection molded parts, which makes her very valuable here at Zometry for helping customers take their projects from start to finish. So with that, I will pass it over to your engineers. All right, awesome. Hey, Serena, thank you so much uh, again for getting the webinar together, uh, making sure we're, we have the right crew on board. Uh, Kira is an awesome resource. And if uh, you have already worked with Zometry from the injection mold side of things, uh, you may, let me get my video back on, you may have already uh, have worked with Kira in the past. Uh, she's an amazing almost consultant for you when you're talking, going through the mold stages and strategies and a go-to resource here at Zometry. Uh, today is about injection mold. So on our agenda, um, we're going to start with uh, talking about Zometry for those who are new and briefly going over the website, uh, our coding tool, and even how to use that tool for injection mold requests. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, molding, molding with Zometry, uh, some of the uh, injection mold principles. Uh, so you have to know the process to understand these design fundamentals. And then I'm gonna go through what I call the molding trinity, which are the three things I do on every single mold project and something that you can do uh, instantly within your CAD platform. So it's something that's just ex extremely useful and extremely useful tool for evaluating your project for mold. Uh, we're gonna go into some uh, more specific design tips and then finish off with re additional resources and Q&A. All right, so if you are new to Zometry, uh, we are a company that is solving this problem of procurement. So we are building out a simple, elegant experience to design parts where you can upload your 3D design, get an instant price, and then with that price and lead time, purchase right online. So we are making a very quick process to what typically is a very opaque situation where you're sending out to five, six vendors you may not know and uh, getting some feedback uh, um, you know, five, six, seven days later. We are very quick, we're very responsive. And again, a lot of our processes actually give an instant price and feedback directly online. Uh, because we have this beautiful almost storefront for getting custom manufactured parts, we also help uh, solve this issue for um, local machine shops and distributed, uh, distributed manufacturers uh, all across the U.S. here, which is they are looking to fill their capacity. We actually have a manufacturing partner network of over 3,000 shops that are distributed, distributed and have different talent sets to them. We're able to pair the work that is awarded through Zometry with those shops that are most capable of performing that work. So we're able to get more competitive pricing, uh, and we're also able to hit the quality and specifications that you require while giving those shops the work that they're actually looking for. So it is a pair that is really a fundamental within our technology platform. 
So the platform itself starts with the site. And I'm going to take you through the site very quickly here. So actually, let's go to the main Zometry's homepage. So Zometry's homepage is a resource in itself for manufacturing. Um, I'm going to actually show you some uh, quick tips on, how, on where to navigate to if you're looking for different technologies, because we offer 11 uh, core technology umbrellas. So sometimes you may want to start off with our design guides under our resources tab. You can check out some of the videos, including some uh, pre-recorded webinars like we've done, uh, like we're doing today here. Um, our blog, which uh, is usually highlighting case studies and other uh, manufacturing tips. Um, our FAQ, which is exactly what you're looking for. If you're searching for something, we're looking at that. We're creating an article around it. So it's, it is true FAQ there. And uh, other resources about uh, things like tolerances, finishes, or manufacturing standards, you can find uh, right on Zometry site. Uh, but let's go and talk about this, uh, this interface. So let's go and get a quote. So like I said, everything on Zometry's technology platform starts with this 3D CAD model. So once you have your 3D CAD model, you can go ahead and upload it to our website. I'm going to go ahead and add this X tile. It's just a little demo piece that we do uh, of our logo here. And that's it. You just What just happened there was that instant pricing. So the second this is uploaded, um, it actually defaulted to the least expensive material to make this part at quantity one. And you can see already a um, standard and an expedite delivery fee. In this case, it's actually looking at a 3D printing technology. So this is 3D printed FDM to make this part. But I want to show you how easy it is to configure to other technologies. So I'm going to click Modify Part here. And again, you could do this with one or multiple parts. So you can help, if you have a whole bill of material, you could upload all those at once as well. So you can go and preview your part here, see how it's interpreted through. Um, you could change your quantities, change your processes, and even change things like uh, uh, part marking inspection requirements, et cetera. So let's go ahead and say I'm, I'm in a prototyping phase, right? So I'm taking this part and I'm about to bring it to mold. So maybe I want to do a fit check. I'm going to use stereolithography, which is a very accurate and a very quick process uh, that we could choose here. So I'm going to go down to one of our seven 3D printing technologies, uh, SLA in this case. And under SLA, I have 14 different materials. Uh, I like Acura 60. It's a go-to stable, um, has some translucency to it, uh, very dimensionally stable. And you can see here, I have my price and lead time uh, right away uh, for this Acura 60 part. I could change my quantity, see how the price updates instantly uh, within our website. But you know what? We're talking about molding today, so let me show you how easy it is to change this to a mold request. Going through our process again, you can see our 3D printing processes. We also offer uh, machining services. Uh, sheet metal, urethane casting, and I'm going to select injection molding. So injection molding has choices. If you look around yourself right now, probably actually the, the computer in front of you itself probably has about 20 odd pieces that are injection molded. It's an extremely common process with a lot of choices. So as you're looking through, you can see we have a very robust list of materials available. We even have uh, custom materials and customer supplied material uh, checklists here. Um, you can choose from your materials, you know, a bunch of different colors. If you're looking for a filler, like a glass fill, for instance, or additives, like say you need something static dissipative, uh, you can take a look there. Again, if you have a custom resin, you can actually write it in your notes. And also, we want a little bit more information about your project needs. So what does the next six months look like for you? What do the next six years look like for you? Because that's going to help us understand what this part's going to live in. Is it a prototype? Do you really think you're going to need like 2,000 and you're probably going to be done? or maybe even like only 50 uh, for this run, um, or is it production where you're expecting to have estimated annual volumes of X? And at that point, uh, you could choose these tool requirements. Let's say this is a production tool. Uh, I'm going to keep it at 50,000 unit there um, and keep some of these other defaults safe properties. So what I've created here is a communication to the Zometry molding team. I can press request a manual quote, and our team will get back to you, probably Kira, actually, uh, to discuss some more about the project. If you have any specific uh, certifications needed, you can also add certifications. Uh, we do have um, an entire ITAR network, so if you are working on defense-related work, uh, make sure that you are checking uh, uh, something like ITAR EAR registration. Um, a lot of times also those will come in pair with needs for COCs and even maybe some material certs as well. So you can add those certifications again in the upper left-hand corner. So I can request a quote. It'll go to our team, our team will review it and get back to you as soon as we can, usually within that, within that day. So within 24 hours. So 
That's your quoting engine, lots of configurability to it, one site. And again, beyond injection molding, uh, we do a ton of 3D printing. Uh, we have those seven different technologies. And under, as far as materials listings, probably hundreds of different materials and configurations for 3D printing, uh, sheet metal, casting, metal, 3D printing, and CNC machining are all staples of Zometry's platform. So now let's talk molding, guys. Uh, so I'm going to actually pass this off to Kira. And Kira will be discussing uh, uh, molding and mo molding with Zometry and molding as the process itself. So Kira. Awesome, so thank you for that, Greg. Um, one thing I do like to talk about is not only why molding with Zometry, but like why would you choose Zometry amongst everyone else? So the injection molding offers the cheapest process for you know your at scale plastics. Um, the, it's the most consistent and repeatable um, process out there to produce a plastic part. We target mid to high volumes for manufacturing. It's the, we have the highest variety of materials, colors, and configurations out there. Um, this process does specifically amongst, you know, other processes such as thermoforming, blow molding, such as that. Um, and also the custom cosmetics from polish to texturing. So we offer a wide range of that as well. So molding with Zometry, um, I like to call this the have it your way approach. So with that being said, um, we don't only focus on open closed molds, we offer side action cores. We, um, you know, we specialize a lot in complex projects um, such as something that has a lot of holes in it or a lot of different features, anything like that. Um, we offer long-term solutions. So we don't just focus on prototyping. Like Greg said before, we do offer a prototype tool that can go as high as a million parts per se on the tool life of that tool. Um, one thing that Zometry holds a high standard to is our communication, um, not only between the customer and the sales representative, but also engineering resources. So like Greg said, um, I will be answering a lot of calls as well. And I am obviously an engineer, so um, that is not common in a lot of the industry. Um, we do offer 24 hour quoting and DFM feedback as well. Um, so like Greg said, as soon as you hit that request manual quote button, um, somebody would get back to you in 24 hours. We have a large um, partner network domestically. So that's where we default. We take a lot of pride in that. Um, and last on the slide is that we do manage the project from start to finish. So um, there is only one point of contact for the customer. Yeah. And, and something to note too is uh, just going back to our manufacturing partner network is that we have this large variety. Like there's um, every single machine shop, every single manufacturer has kind of their their key uh, target audience, like what type of parts they like to make. And with the diversity of these shops, I, I know we have some that just love to do the ITAR EAR work, some that just love these like, you know, short little aluminum molds that uh, offer prototypes and rapid turns. And I mean, we have the whole gamut. Is that right, Kira? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Mm hmm. So here we just talk about a little bit about the quotes, um, how it's common to share within the 24 hours of receiving it from our internal quoting team to you um, as the customer. So Greg, go ahead. All right, now I'm going to hand it back off to Greg. Um, or actually, no, I think I'm going to take over this one. Sorry about that. We so, can talk um, about this one too, but yeah. We'll, yeah, we can we'll go, go together. Through. That's okay. Um, so a little bit about how the process works. So how does injection molding for, works? Well, first we start off with, um, there's a, a big amount of pelletized plastic resin is fed through the hopper, where then it gets fed into the barrel and the screw heats it up. So it becomes a homogenous melt. Um, it's then channeled into the tool where it's injected and it is um, becomes the form or the shape of the part. So once it's held in there for a while, it cools and then the part is ejected into a bin or a conveyor um, for final process. And that is a cyclic process. So it happens um, as soon as that cycle ends, it starts over again. And what's, what's like a normal cycle time usually for, for a part? Typically, depending on the size, of course, less than a minute, easily. Um, typically, we see around 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So some terms that we feel um, could be helpful. A single cavity tool is basically just having one part in a mold. So you're only producing one part um, coming out of each cycle. A family tool is multiple parts. 
um, with similar geometries and masses, if you will. So that way we're shooting the same amount of plastic into two different parts. It might be like a left hand and a right hand of assembly housing or something like that. Um, a multi-cavity tool is just the same part over and again in a tool. Um, typically you have a, um, a cheaper per piece price, if you will. Um, and then, but the only, um, I guess you could say consideration of that is having a higher upfront tooling cost. So with um, producing a larger amount of parts at once, you have to give somewhere, right? So um, that is the higher tool cost. A setup fee is a line item that you'll see on our quote. It is associated per run of the tool. So once the tool is taken off the shelf and put it in the machine, that is applied there. So this typically occurs whenever a customer is to come back and reorder um, the part that we had made the tool for originally. So gating and gate vestige are features on the part where the material is injected. Like Greg said, there's a ton of injection molded parts around you. If you go and look at one, you'll see a little blemish on the edge of the part and it, that is where it was um, injected at. So, which is really cool. <laughs> Um, ejector pins, again, when you're looking at that part, you're going to turn around on the non-cosmetic side and you'll see little circular features. That's where the parts are kicked out of the mold. Um, the parting line. Again, this is a visible line as well on the part that you're looking at. It is where the two halves come together to make the part. The two halves of the mold, that is. And then a shutoff is um, just a term for where the mold comes together and shuts against itself to produce any plastic from or prevent any plastic from flowing out. So um, those are just some terms that we feel would be helpful um, with injection molding. There is a lot of terms thrown out there that might not be common sense or obvious to what the um, description is. So we just like to share that. Yeah, and I think we were talking about this because we we're talking about the essentially mold size, right? So it, it is when you when you think about a mold tool, it's not just the things that are the core and cavity. So if I'm molding a part that say the size of my hand, it's not just something that's slightly bigger than my hand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a multi-layered block and two sides of that to that have multiple assemblies. So oftentimes there's dozens of parts within these assemblies and all these mechanized uh, pieces have, have a purpose. So this, for example, this inject, those ejector pins um, where that material is flowing through uh, from that aug screw auger to the, uh, to the parts has something called a runner, for example. And uh, all these, all these fe design features have a purpose. Uh, so, I know um, I may be getting ahead of us, but I know, for example, you own your tool at Zometry. So if you uh, um, order Zometry injection molding, you're paying for that upfront cost and you are buying your tool. And that, uh, um, that tool itself, uh, I know sometimes, uh, you know, they're like, hey, should I just hold on to it? I'm like, Let, let's have the molders hold on to that because that's about 800 pounds. <laughs> you know, let's, let's have someone who has a, has a forklift in the crane and uh, the proper the proper environment to hold on to that uh, that's tool uh, keep a hold of it. You know we usually will keep tools for um, like two to three years and we'll give a call and say like all right so tell me a little bit about this has it out revved uh, uh, what's the future of this? Uh, but uh, just just know that when we talk about these toolings injection molding, it's not just the shape right. It is this entire assembly that goes in and and has to be essentially pressed together with what we call tonnage, right? So it's literally, when you talk about a 100 ton press, it means I'm pressing this mold face together at 100 tons in order to uh, allow that, that thermoplastic to inject in without actually you know, squeezing out the sides and creating flash. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and then one thing on that previous slide real quick is what I forgot yeah. to mention with the family tool. Um, we find that customers really like this option because again, mm -hmm. it saves money up front. So instead of, um, you know, if a customer submits two parts to get quoted and they're kind of similar in shape and geometry and mass and everything, um, instead of getting two separate molds, which could be a large capital investment, of course, um, we have the ability to put those together and that way we save a lot of money up front um, on that capital investment. So. That's just one thing I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, and it's 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 super popular and it's something that's not mm -hmm. commonly offered, uh, um, but it's very accessible. And actually, a lot of our mold makers uh, like that as well. Yes. So some common resins that are used in the industry and that we have capability of sourcing as well, um, commodity thermoplastics, we find that, you know, a polystyrene, a santaprene, um, ABS, polycarbonate, polypropylene, those are all very common plastics, um, nylon too, especially. And uh, we, we have the ability to source whatever is available in the US. So if you come to us and either you select, you know, polystyrene on the drop down menu, which is that PS, 
um, we can just choose a generic grade. Or if you come and say, hey, I want polystyrene, this number, this grade, this supplier, we have the capability to do that as well. So um, that's one thing that separates zometry um, from the rest as well, is just being able to source whatever material is that you want. And with that being said, we have the capability to do that with coloring as well. If you have a Pantone color um, or Pantone number, excuse me, that you provide, we can source that. So no problem at all. Um, another thing I'll mention too, listed under exotic or specialty resins is customer supplied resin. So I believe Greg briefed on this before, but we do have the ability to um, receive the, the material straight from the customer. So from you, if you have a Gaylord sitting in your, your shop or whatever, and you're like, well, I really want to use this material on this project, but obviously our mold isn't in house um you can just ship that to us and we can we can use that so yeah and, and just something to notice because we have this network uh i know uh sometimes there is a resin that may be only available in like china like easily available there but it may be very difficult to get domestically um we do have the resources uh especially with um, our material providers and compounders to even find a comp comparable match to, to offer for this difficult to source uh, resins right. Because uh, sometimes the resin can be the longer lead time than the actual tool making. Yes, we absolutely don't want that to be the bottleneck. Yeah. Awesome. Um, to get a little bit more specific, we've narrowed it down to a couple different industries. Um, the first being handheld and wearable electronics. So typically we, we see a PC ABS blend or just ABS by itself in this to um, form the housing of those parts. That's um, something that whenever I think of ABS, I think of those big bulky T9 calculators. So that's all ABS. So if you want to get a visual um, um, and then fixturing in brackets. So we, a lot of times we see a glass filled nylon or an Altem, a PEI, um, you know, whatever it is that may be Delrin even. So we do see that specific to that um, industry. And with automotive, gosh, there's a wide range, but to narrow it down, PBT, glass filled nylon, um, PPE, PS blend. And again, with that, even um, polypropylene is common as well. So right. um, mm -hmm. so what we, uh, we're working on getting a lot of notice in the medical industry as well. And we see, um, surprisingly, we do see a lot of peak polycarbonate and polystyrene, um, some, even some HDPE. And we have the capability to supply medical grade um, clean room produced, everything like that. I'm sure, Greg, you have something, some stories or something to touch on that. <laughs> stories here and there. I could just say, uh, uh, understanding, we've, we've, we've been working on medical devices uh, for a while and understanding what your stage gates are, uh, where you're going through your trials, uh, especially if you're going through FDA trials, and understanding when a clean room is necessary and even what the handling of the part is, it's really important to get those requirements up front. Uh, because say you're doing a, um, say you, do, you overscope uh, and you have a certain clean room, all of a sudden everything becomes, you know, a little bit more pricier because you are, that staff is in a clean room facility it's themselves. So even the tool makers, the designers, the operators, um, everything has a little bit of a raise there. And uh, the other side is, you know, any handling of the part. Uh, so say you're doing a double bag of the part after, right after molding, uh, um, if that's necessary, that, that's an added labor cost per part. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, for the end justifies the means, if that's a requirement, but it's just really important when you're working on medical devices uh, to know where you are in the stage of your development and what is, what is necessary for those parts, uh, because we want to make sure that we're giving you the best offer possible, the best value for you. Yep, absolutely. Awesome. So um, now I'm going to transition a little bit into the tooling. So the tooling is designed around the part. Um, it's designed around the geometry. We specifically designed the tool um, off of the CAD that we receive from you. So the CAD file that you upload, um, we prefer step. I'm going to throw that out there, step files. We just take that and that's what we start to cut the tool out of or after of. Um, so when closed, like Greg said, it's closed under high, high tonnage. Um, the molten plastic is injected in at a very, very high pressure. So you'll see it's closed together very, very tightly um, where the shutoffs are. So you can't let fl plastic throw, flow throughout that. Um, the part is quickly cooled and then the tool must open and inject the part without damage. And that's the image that you're seeing um, to the right of that. So the mold is open in this case. Those little ejector pins are forward. That green part is pulled out by a robot. Sometimes it's just ejected out and it falls down into a bin. Um, that robot's probably just going to take it to either a secondary post-process or put it on a conveyor and let it cool just a little bit longer. Um, if the part does have undercuts, either slide or hand-loaded cores will create those features. So we do have capabilities of each, like I did mention before. Um, we can easily, easily, um, you know, fixture a slide or 
um, have the ability to put hand-loaded pores into the mold to um, create those side action features. And, and Kira, just really quick, when, when I talk about slide versus hand-loaded core, I mean, what does that, what does that look like in the process? Sure. So a slide is used typically when we have a higher volume. So, um, you know, a hand loaded core, obviously by name, it's somebody standing there hand loading these cores into the mold. That way, you know, if it's just a low, low amount of parts being ran, that's no big deal. But once you get into the tens of thousands, um, you, you know, we transition to a slide. So basically a slide is a mechanical feature where once the mold closes, there's a pin um, and it basically pushes the slide into the part to create that feature. And then the plastic is molded on top of that. And I think it's really interesting because again, hand loads tend to be cheaper on the tool side because mm -hmm. you're not putting that automation in and you don't have this kind of horn feature that's, uh, that's uh, moving that, uh, that action in place. Uh, right. But from a uh, per part side, you do have operator sanding there. So it's not a lights out activity. Right. Uh, so and this all comes into really that what's my six weeks, what's my six months, what's my six year plan for this particular revision of this part. If you are in full production, you're probably going to be moving to something that's automated where it's a set it and run it uh, uh, setup. Uh, but if you are in something where you know your part revision may modify before this tool life will expire, uh, it may be worth spending uh, less on the tool and a little bit more on those parts by mm -hmm. using hand loads and some other tricks of the trade. Right. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, going over, again, this, this molding trinity, which is uh, something that's so useful. And I found after speaking in the past about injection molding uh, that a lot of folks who are using CAD don't know how powerful these, so these three simple things are. Um, I literally just added a screenshot, you know, 10 minutes before the presentation from uh, my SOLIDWORKS platform here to show you uh, draft analysis, undercut analysis, thickness analysis. It's right under the evaluate section. Um, I'm running SOLIDWORKS, uh, but I also know that in uh, many other professional CAD programs, you're going to have uh, the sim uh, similar analysis available um, just with the standard packages. Um, so this is not mold flow, um, but these are super, super useful tools here. So. Uh, the first slide here, I'm going to focus on undercuts. And when we talk about undercuts, uh, we're talking about uh, thinking about this mold as an A and B side opening and closing. So I, when I shut the mold, uh, essentially anything that if I'm looking face onto the part and on the front and back, anything that's under a shadow is considered an undercut. So this part right here, for example, if I'm looking at it from top down, I can see all this interior facing here at the top. If I'm looking from bottom up, I can see all the uh, exterior faces here. Uh, but this, uh, this side hole will be obstructed, right? It'll be under a shadow. And that means I need to somehow form that feature, but not from those two sides meeting. So I could do a couple things there, right? I could just mitigate it and you know, take that feature out and modify it in a way where, um, where I could actually just go and close the mold and maybe have some shutoffs in the middle. Or I can go and attack it with a hand load core or a slide, uh, like Kara was just describing here. Uh, so in actual kind of a, a part that I use a lot, this little drone leg um, design that uh, that we throw around a lot. I I chose this face here, uh, so the blue face. Uh, clicked uh, undercut analysis, and all of a sudden the things that are highlighting red are showing me, hey, if I'm thinking about this as a two-part mold, I have features that I can't make without adding some sort of uh, extra action here. So these red parts that mean that an extra, extra pull is needed. So this part here instantly becomes a open close mold with at least a side side action, whether it is a hand load core um, or a slide to create essentially this face and this these two holes and this slot feature here. Um, Something to note though is sometimes undercuts can't just be attacked from the outside, right? So if I'm uh, if I have something that say I have a sphere and I drill a hole in it and I have this hollow inside shell, uh, there's no way that I can actually get a tool in to actually hold that void and then collapse and get out of that area. Uh, so that would be a die lock situation where uh, we see this a lot if you're playing with lofts or you're, if you're playing with uh, certain designs that have a industrial design outer contour um, and you're say you have an access port on the side. Uh, sometimes if you run an undercut analysis, you'll see like a little red area uh, right at the top of the dome. And that's just a place where you may want to either modify the design or maybe add a little wall thickness there that'll that'll uh, uh, help you hit into a draft, like into the draft uh, and uh, mitigate that undercut. So dialogue, again, it just me means that I can mold it once, 
I just can't take the mold apart afterwards. So it's not something that we, we prefer to do or that we'll ever move forward with the mold uh, uh, without some uh, DFM changes there. Um, this also is a great uh, tool for showing where the parting line is going to be and helping you think about how to attack the parting line creative, creatively. So the second that you choose a face, you're going to see some things highlight, uh, some things not highlight. And uh, I have an example, a couple slides ahead of us that shows what that'll look like where you could definitely see that parting line there. But it's a really useful tool for us. Um, and then, again, best practice, if you want to save costs, you want to focus on what your design intent is while uh, mitigating the need for things like uh, things like side actions or slides because it just adds time and adds cost to your part itself. So uh, this slot example here, um, or this sorry, the snap tab example here is a good example of making a feature like a pass through core. So if I did an undercut analysis on this face, this whole area under shadow would not be something that I can access with the open close tool. But by adding a hole at the base here, so basically a little rectangular feature, and again, parts in front of you probably have this right now, uh, we can actually put a rectangular tab on one of the uh, pieces of the mold and close it up and it creates a shutoff that will actually help create this feature. When it opens up, you have uh, you have your snap tab feature. So that's something called a pass through core. It's a really, really powerful mindset and tool used when you're designing uh, for, uh, for injection molding there. They are your friend. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and sometimes it's sometimes honestly the mentality is, all right, I got my design. Now let's see how many times, like, let's get the undercuts and see what I can do with pass throughs. And uh, you start kind of chopping away and uh, and some it, it really does uh, spur some creative juices sometimes. So it's uh, well, not to yeah, not to mention or to pick up on that. Um, you know, if you do have an undercut, of course, there's going to be costs associated with that. So if you are able to design around it and mitigate it, like um, Greg said, then you can reduce the per piece price and the tooling cut price. So it's a win-win. Absolutely. Um, so the, check, the second check I have there is uh, a wall thickness. Uh, so I'm not going to go in this presentation in the details of what a good wall thickness is because it's so dependent on different materials that you're using. Some materials flow better and can make really thin features. Uh, some materials are a little bit more viscous um, when they're being injected under pressure. Uh, so they actually like a, a, some pathway there. So maybe like a two millimeter thickness or something where they could kind of move through. I know we were using a glass bell polycarbonate that was kind of, it favored the thick um, to actually move around in, in, into a part design there. Uh, but just understand that, say I have something that is designed like a top hat. Uh, so we get my little upside down top hat here. <laughs> when I build um, When I build a design like this, and if 3D prints well and machines well, um, you know, not a problem in the prototyping stage. But once I move the injection mold, understand that you cannot argue with plastic. You can't be like ABS today. I want you to be different. It's always going to act like <laughs> ABS, you know. And so, so you want to come back and uh, and take a look at your design and look at these these uh, um, differentiations between your nominal wall thickness and a thick section here. And again, on my little drone leg, you can tell I have like kind of like some thicker areas here and here, uh, and even this mid wall here is is thicker. And what that's going to do is it's going to cool slower than the rest of the parts. So those nominal wall thicknesses are actually going to cool at the at a very even rate and a predictable rate. When you have these thicker areas, they're going to cool slower. And when it's cooling, that that material is shrinking, it's pulling, and it'll pull everything else around it. So with this top hat design here. It's going to have a little dimple. Sometimes this looks like a straight line. Sometimes it looks like a little thumbprint. Sometimes it looks like a void where it actually looks like a, a pothole, and that's where uh, it it actually uh, crystallizes, uh, freezes off on the outside, but it leaves some stuff on the inside because it's uh, it's actually pulling from uh, outside or inside out. Uh, so we want you to make coring. We want you to use ribs. We want you to use even wall features to design the mechanical function of your part versus just making a part th uh, thicker uh, for, for example, to add stiffness to a part there. So I, I always talk to talk about customers when we talk about strength, uh, about uh, the plastic forks and knives that you get at picnics, right? You can cut a steak with this plastic knife. And the reason why is not because that knife is thick, it's because it's designed with uh, the proper ribbing. Uh, so it has, it's almost a T-shape in the cross section it's designed with, a, it's engineered to actually 
uh, perform the way that it needs to perform. So it is keeping those principles of even wall thickness uh, while, while, um, while also having mechanical function through design. Uh, so yeah, again, like looking at this part here, I have some sink marks. I have some uh, places where very likely I'll have some dips. And even this thick area right in the middle, so kind of think of this as a kind of a center rib, what I'd probably see if I did mold this part as is, see a little pothole here, a little dip here, and I probably see a little depression line going down lengthwise on this part because what it's going to be doing is pulling from somewhere and it's going to end up affecting my outer wall surface there. Yep. So just understand that that tool is really useful. Find your nominal, put that in, look for overly thick features, press calculate, last couple seconds, and you get a really nice output about where to attack. And so we talked about undercuts, wall thickness, and now the last check that we have is draft angles. It is actually the required thing that we need for releasing a part from the mold, but I put it last because a lot of times you want to fix your file for, for moldability first, fixing those undercuts, fixing the, uh, the wall thicknesses, and then draft your part. So that's why I have it as kind of my last check. Uh, you could do these at any time during your, your design stage, though. Um, think about if you had, uh, let's, let's think about stacking solo cups. So stacking solo cups, the cups, I can you know, take two fingers, take one solo cup out. The second that it moves a millimeter up, it's now released from the solo cup underneath, right? It, it, has, um, that, it has that angle design, and that is kind of what we're looking for in draft angles. Now think about uh, uh, stacking paper towel rolls. And if you're trying to shove paper towel rolls into each other and, un, un, and take this out, it doesn't work well. And it's the same principle in injection molding, that if you, are, if you have something without draft, what's going to happen is I can melt plastic around there. The plastic, again, you, you know, plastic will behave like plastic, but the second I try to actually open up that tool, it's going to drag that feature, likely deform or cause or look like, or create what looks like little scrape marks to it. It's not good for your part, it's not good for your tools, it's not good for repeatability, consistency, or anything that we really stand, stand for here at Zometry. So we're gonna, ask, we're gonna ask you about drafting and adding draft angles to um, uh, to your parts, and it's part of our DFM feedback that we have. Uh, understand that, you know, one degree is usually a good rule of thumb. About, uh, would you say about a, a degree per uh, inch, Kira, something like that? Yeah, just about. I mean, we we do request at least one degree. Um, again, it, it could change for different locations or features on the part. Like, you know, for instance, shutoffs. Ideally, we would like more than that, um, just because you are shutting steel on steel. So it could be a little bit more abrasive. Right, exactly. So it could be a little bit more abrasive. So we do request maybe three to five there. But uniformly uh, across the part of on ribs or, you know, other features, uh, one degree is ideal. Yeah. And I'd even be looking like, yeah, if, um, increased draft angle. So uh, there's a part that we did at the very beginning. It looks like this blue part. I actually, I had it for a Q and A. And don't forget, guys. Uh, Any time during this, write some questions down. We're going to answer them uh, uh, shortly here. Um, mm -hmm. But I have a little part here that has a. Um, it's an MT11020, but it's a mold texture texture to it, and uh, it gives it kind of a matte outer look. Uh, but on the side, it, it actually has a finer matte finish. It's actually in one of our SPI finishes, so it's SPI B3 on the side here. And the reason why was the angle that they needed to design this part, they couldn't do the MT texture because uh, you usually need about three degrees uh, draft in order to release it without those uh, cosmetic pool marks to it. So we ended up creating, keeping it very nice and matte and making the part look consistent where the cosmetic face has that mold texturing while the sides actually has more of a matte um, matte finish, like a bead blast finish to, to the mm -hmm. side there. Uh, so we can, uh, we can again do clever things to this. So sometimes it's just change your texture here if you need that draft angle. Uh, sometimes it's uh, add draft to in order to get that texture. But understand texture does usually add a, add a degree or so uh, for proper release. So let's put it together. So I have this drone leg here. Um, I was doing I was doing these uh, checks, right? I was like, all right, so this guy, it, it, we need to put it on a diet. We need to thin, it, thin out areas a little bit. Uh, so um, added some chlorine, chopped away a little bit. Uh, you can't see it from this side, but I, I took, a, took out some material from the bottom here. Um, also talking about the uh, draft position. So in my mind, I, I looked at the undercuts and I said, you know what? I think that I should actually have a parting down the center here. So uh, I, I went and essentially made this part as if I was making half the part, 
drafted it appropriately and then mirrored it uh, because this is a mirror image here to make the other half. So you can see I have a draft in one direction, a draft in another direction with the intent of a party line going down the center to create most of the body of this and then a side pull, so a side action creating this flat face here. When I do that side action, that also means that these edges, so any any edge that I actually want to create using um, uh, using that uh, uh, the pool here, I need to make sure I'm drafting for that direction. So there's actually three directions of pool uh, with this part here. Uh, so you can take a quick, quick look, and by doing this, this just brought this part from about 70% to about 92% uh, ready to be molded. And then a few quick tweaks, and we'll, we're ready to, ready to get going with the design. Honestly, this design is probably good to go. Uh, I, I was actually criticizing myself about a little bit more here that I could have done, but otherwise, you know, uh, you know, this is this is something where we did this exercise and probably within like 25, 30 minutes, um, we had a modification uh, of a design from a CNC design to an injection mold. So it's a really great way to get started and understand principles of molding. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, um, real quick on that is, we do pride ourselves on um, offering feedback um, and guidance in your designs as well. So we are here to help you along the way. That's typically, you know, I, I do that a lot. So that is typically one, one of the major roles in my um, job here at Zometry is to help the customer and help you understand, you know, maybe make this tweak here, make it a little bit more moldable or reduce costs or whatever we can do um, to help you get that part across the finish line. So we are here to help. Yeah, uh, we, we always talk about, you know, making parts, you know, uh, like 3D printing is kind of dating and injection molding is a marriage. You know, you want to you want to find the right spouse. Uh, and I think that's where really, really if you look at the feedback uh, from what's uh, Zometry, it's all about the service aspect that we give. Um, you know, we have this really slick interface that, uh, you know, gets, makes it as easy as that click, drag, upload and buy. Uh, but really what that does is it gives us time to really focus on the part uh, on the parts in the project. And our goal is not to make parts. Our goal is to make your project success successful. And so that's Absolutely. what we really have a mindset for. Absolutely. So these are some cool tips. Um, I didn't want to overcrowd the slides because they're already overcrowded. So I have a few tips at the very end here. And then, uh, like I said, we're going to go over some resources and Q&A. Uh, uh, but I found this really useful. And it's something I actually wish I knew uh, when I was in product development about five years ago. Uh, on how to use uh, ribs and bosses because we talked about uniform wall thickness and uh, usually I'm trying to spot over thick features uh, but a lot of times you, that means when you're designing everything and all things equal uh, in rib thickness you still may get something like a like a show through on uh, your design part actually even on that blue part that I have right there I can actually see a small little ring where a um, a rib feature on the inside shows you a little bit, but the mold texture almost completely uh, negates it. Uh, but it's just something that does exist because again, you can't argue with plastic. You can't say, no, this time don't sink. It's, it's design intent. By making your ribs 40 to 60% of the outer walls. So say you have a outer wall that's 100 thou. And uh, if you make that rib at about half of that, half of that, you're probably gonna still have good structure. You're gonna allow material to flow through and uh, it actually will have a lot less chance or a lot less show through on the other side. A really good example is if I'm making a panel and say I have a grid pattern on the on one side of ribs, uh, making those ribs uh, thinner uh, will help uh, not show the grid pattern on the other side. Um, sometimes if I'm making something that's for construction or mechanical, it doesn't really matter. It's all about stiffness and strength anyways. But if you're looking for something that has a cosmetic uh, you know, showcase finish to it, it's something to really consider. Um, other side is, you know, draft still apply. So if you have a really tall part and a really tall uh, rib, uh, sometimes that drafting will get so thick at the boss that you need to really consider that. And there's some tricks and even like sometimes we just need to reduce the draft angle necessary and do a little bit more, uh, more careful tooling strategy uh, with that. But it's just something to understand is that if you have something really uh, with really deep draw and you're drafting it, that, that thickness at the base is going to be thicker because of the draft angle and at the very top. Um, the boss trick that, that I really like is uh, sometimes when you're making bosses, if you look on the other side of your part, and there's again, there's probably like three parts in front of you that you could see this on, uh, there you'll see a little donut shape, a little donut shape depression. And that's from the use, so the boss is essentially, you know, a cylinder. And what will happen is that um, the material here 
even though you're following all these good even, even wall thicknesses, if you imagine this, this as a sphere, like there's actually a material, this is pulling in here and it's gonna be pulling in uh, as it's cooling a little bit uh, more material creating a depression here. So what you wanna do is kind of relieve that. And you could do that by thinking about your part as 100%. If you make the inside of your boss at that 30%, so again, if I'm talking about something that's 100 thou, and I make my boss 30 thou deeper, as well as create a groove, groove that is 30 thou deep and then goes up 30 degrees here, so basically a ring around the, the boss there, uh, you can actually significantly mitigate and sometimes negate sink showing through on those parts. Um, it's a really neat trick. It even works if you have ribs. So if you have a boss that's kind of designed like a rocket ship there, you have some fins coming out. Um, you can do that just, you, you could do that, uh, just the, the fins actually have to go down and meet uh, at the bottom there because if not, you create an undercut and we're back mm -hmm. at undercuts. Uh, <laughs> but other, otherwise, uh, it's, it's something that's very, very useful. And especially if you're using something that's showcase and use, I'm, I'm doing, a, I suck that 50, 100,000, 1 million production mode. Uh, it's, it starts to become much, much more useful for you. Absolutely. So, uh, again, I, I want to say going back to sinks, you can't argue with plastic. Sometimes it wins, uh, but uh, depending on what materials and what your application is. I have, I have a couple workhorses at home, uh, so some you know, stands for wood cutting and stuff, and they are, they are full of sink. But you know what? I don't care. I have two boy two by fours in them, and I could hammer away, and they're absolutely fine. So yeah. it's all application dependent on what 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 really matters most to your project. Um, so the other um, other couple items I want to talk about uh, very briefly, and we can answer some more questions about this in the Q and A as well, is uh, um, mold inserts and overmolds. Uh, so we we do uh, insert molding, and we also do overmolding. Insert molding uh, would be like, for example, this is a CNC machine part that we put an elastomer and overmolded it on here. Uh, so this is, well, uh, so this is where I'm taking a part. Sometimes it's off the shelf, sometimes it's custom manufactured, and I'm actually molding plastic around it. The thing to understand is that metal and you know elastomers don't usually bond well, so you want to add mechanical features. So if I had an X-ray to this, you would actually see that this has a couple, what looks like a, a few O-ring grooves on the metal part there. And that allows me to mold this uh, molten uh, plastic around it, and it also will fill those grooves, creating an actual mechanical joint where it's difficult for it to remove. Um, same thing with overmolds. So overmolds, uh, sometimes you can do flat on flat overmolds where you're adding, say, an ABS with a TPE material, and there is a little bit of a chemical bond that happens there. Uh, but if this thing is gonna have anywhere and you, and you wanna de-risk uh, delamination, Add features, so for example, a little dovetail features, uh, anything like through holes, anything that allows that material to actually um, inject through, be exposed on the other side, and create a mechanical uh, attachment there. And it's just very useful. It's, uh, it's something that we see a lot where we see the design intent. But we usually go in and say, uh, go in and ask uh, for some more mechanical features. It's the exact same thing if you're bonding parts together uh, physically. You know, if I'm epoxying something, I'll scratch up those surfaces in order to add a, a little bit more uh, friction there. Uh, and I'm doing the exact same thing when I'm, when I'm designing for molds. Um, the, other, the other side of this is, so just by the way, you can insert mold inserts, so like threaded inserts, uh, something that you may sometimes ultrasonic or heat stake in. Uh, sometimes it's best for us to do that in mold, depending on what the throughput is needed for, the, for these parts. Um, you can do that. We can do that on, on molds uh, as, as required. Um, I, I wanted to also mention that when you're talking threads in general, uh, we can tap for consistency sake and labor sake. Uh, I would actually go on to inserts uh, because it's, it's uh, much, uh, much higher throughput and usually cheaper and more consistent. Um, the other thing is that if you have external threads, external threads actually tend to be drafted well. Like, you have these little triangles there. So if I actually attack an external thread from the, uh, um, with a parting, down, parting line down the middle, most of the time I'm like one small radius away from uh, being able to actually make that in a two-part mold as a feature. But that being said, I will have a parting line up uh, right. those ridges there. I recommend, uh, and you'll see some best practices there where you just take a little uh, cut, uh, essentially shave off the two sides of this. And you may see those, again, parts in front of you right now that may have this feature. And uh, that will actually mitigate where that party line is so it doesn't interfere with what it's screwing into. Uh, so 
that's just some considerations, but just something that we get asked a lot. And again, we could go into further detail with that. So let's talk. Uh, I, I want to save, yeah, uh, 10 minutes or so for Q&A. So uh, I, I did show you the site. We have a resources page. We ha also have live engineering support. If you go, uh, for, go to our chat online, um, we're open 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern. <clears throat> Eastern. Uh, you can always contact us, from, contact us from phone, and you have a dedicated account representative. Uh, we have a great injection mold design guide, zombie.com forward slash resources. You can take a look at design guides for all our processes, but definitely worth checking out here. And Serena. Alrighty. Thanks, everyone, <laughs> for sticking around. Um, so I'm here to close us out with a promotion as well as Q&A after this. Um, so for if it's your first time ordering injection molding from Zometry, please feel free to mention this coupon code new mold order to get $500 off your first Zometry molding order. Um, and now for Q&A, we had a couple of questions come in here. So um, let's start with talking about um, Zometry injection molding suppliers. So what does one point of contact mean? because customers, <clears throat> and what happens when there are multiple types of parts? Do you send it to various suppliers, and does the customer have a role in managing those various suppliers, which is obviously not ideal? Mm -hmm. uh, Kira, do you want to touch this one? Yeah, sure. So um, what one point of contact means is your account representative is your primary point of contact. Um, now, once the order is placed, we do transition to a project management role, and then that becomes your single primary point of contact. So once the sale is handed over and it's closed, um, there, you will have a project manager um, leading your project. And with that being said, there is no um, supplier slash customer interface. It all goes through Zometry. We are your single um, point of contact. There is no management on your end. We handle everything. Um, and with that being said, obviously communication is desired. So we do provide um, significant communication as much as you would like. If you don't want any at all, great. We'll still email you and let you know what the status is. <laughs> but um, or if you want to talk daily, I mean, we are open for it. So we basically want to make this, um, you know, customer first mentality. We want you to um, be happy and feel comfortable working with us. And, and Kira, also on that, I mean, uh, do you want to uh, talk about just kind of kickoff? So what, what happens once a PO comes in, uh, just, you know, very briefly? Yeah, sure. So once we um, receive a PO and the order starts, the lead time that's listed on the quote begins the business day after the PO is submitted and processed. Um, at that time, within those first two days, you'll have that project manager reach out to you, introduce themselves, um, kind of have a kickoff meeting, if you will, and then they'll set aside some time for a formal DFM process. So that's basically where we identify the parting lines, the ejector pin locations, and the gating locations and type. So we do dedicate those first two days to that. That is all built into the lead time, um, so there's no delaying or anything as long as it's completed within those first two days. And of course, on your end, the as the customer, you would approve that and then we move forward with cutting the tool steel. So that's what it looks like right after kickoff. And again, that communication is our number one priority. So we wanna make sure you're satisfied and feel comfortable with every step. Great, so you guys answered two questions in one. Oh, really? <laughs> Boom, yeah. all right. Um, <laughs> all right, next question. So you mentioned drawings with, res so res with respect to tooling. Do, does Zometry need to see 2D drawings to understand the design intent and tolerances? Uh, tolerances, if they're non-standard, the, the answer is yes. So if you have critical tolerances where these are fitting in this assembly and they need to hit this degree, we definitely want to be mindful of that. Uh, if not, we are, we're working off standard machining tolerances uh, to make that tool, which is uh, going to be usually like a plus or minus four uh, to, to making that tool. But, the, but then again, keep in mind the tool is designed with with some scaling and offset for the shrink rate of the material itself, but then uh, your design plus material plus tooling is what you actually get in hand, right? So that's your part. So if there's anything critical to be mindful of, we just want to make sure we we are aware of it, aware of it, or else you're you're going to be working with global generalized tolerances, uh, and uh, which isn't bad at all. It just means that uh, it's something that we we want to be mindful of uh, with drawing. Okay. Yep, and then to carry off that real quick, um, mm -hmm. I know we talked a lot about over molding and insert molding. Um, so we do require a drawing with those just to understand where that part starts and where it stops and where the next one starts and stops. Yeah. So um, just keeping that in mind as well. Okay, thank you guys. 
Um, and what about small vertical walls? Do you, that are a few millimeters or less, do you need to add draft angles still? Greg, you wanna take that one? It's a, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, you should. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's still, it, it really depends on the, on the process because absolutely you can get away with releasing some, uh, some materials without the need for draft uh, to that. Uh, my, my biggest worry there is even if I'm doing like, so we have one degree as a standard, but even if you're adding a quarter uh, degree on these really small walls, uh, it's super, super helpful because the worst thing that could, like, what I don't want to happen is a piece of your part getting stuck into the tool in that little wall there, because there's a few things that will happen. First off, it, you know, it'll show on every part until we catch it, mm -hmm. uh, that, like a missing feature there, but also you got to dig it out and it may damage the tool, especially if you're talking about a really, really thin wall, a wall like that. If you, you know, if I scratch the tool, then that scratch shows on every single part made. So right. we want to be very mindful about our designs uh, um, from from an end-to-end -end standpoint. Uh, you know, we look at the we look at the whole process as a holistic process. Okay, and when you say one degree draft, is that total for both sides, half a degree per side uh, per wall, or is that one degree from the center line? So these, we, you could yep, be <laughs> we do um, request one degree per wall. So that's from either the base of the wall or the very top. So whatever pivot point you want to go after, um, it is one degree per wall. Yeah, it's it's degree as your CAD would actually apply. So if you put one in there, it's going to be applying that per face. Right. Okay. Um, we have a lot more questions coming through. I just awesome. I do want to make a note here that while we will in, end in a couple of minutes, Greg and Kira are going to be reaching out to anyone whose questions do not get answered. So feel free to keep them coming and enter them here. Um, and we'll try and get through as many as possible in these next couple of minutes before <laughs> you guys have to get back to designing. Um, so here's a quick one. Um, some companies require NDAs prior to a PO. Do you regularly agree to customer NDAs? All the time, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. uh, this is where you'll, you'll speak with your account representative, you can, even if you want to get started and you just uh, submit your project. If you email support at zometry.com uh, with your NDA, uh, you can uh, we can actually go start going through the process right away. Um, alternatively, if you do not have an NDA but want to make sure that you have an NDA in place, uh, you can actually go onto our FAQ. So just on that on that live chat, type an NDA. You'll actually see a link where you could download uh, an NDA uh, and something that you can sign. Send to support at zombie.com. That that being said, confidentiality does not require an NDA for us. Every we would not be in business if mm -hmm. we if we shared customer information. Uh, so we we treat every single project uh, um, as it's, as if it's confidential. Um, you know, I I love. When I can share customer parts, when they we do cross promotions, actually Serena writes case studies. Uh, uh, so any great case study that you see is uh, usually uh, there's Serena behind that and interviewing with those customers, and those are volunteered. So customers are coming and and talking about, for example, this great blue part here. Uh, you know, got a great application that they they're working on, and some some of the molded pro parts or projects that uh, we've done for them. Uh, but everything by nature is confidential. Yep. Um, and two, two people have, are asking, how are we making ourselves competitive against China molding? Especially for prototype and production. Greg, you wanna kick off? I can yeah. probably wrap up a little bit. Yeah, you can, you can wrap it. Uh, so there's a couple things happening, right? So we have the, the manufacturing partner network. Even on domestic network, some of these shops that have a, um, have a, a niche for say doing like higher level um, higher level spec work, some of these ITAR work. Uh, when they do low lower level prototype work, it's kind of like a candy mold for them. It's something where they can hit a very competitive rate and if they had the capacity available. Because we have this network approach, a lot of times we can uh, work with mold makers and get a competitive price domestically. That mm -hmm. being said, we also do have international partners. Uh, so. Uh, there, there are certain projects that uh, are good, fit, good fits internationally, and uh, we, you know, Zometry's network, uh, our aspirations are global as well. Uh, so we really do want to be your one-stop shop uh, for on-demand manufacturing, uh, regardless of location of origin, where we should be able to find the right rates and the right, uh, um, right partners to fulfill your projects. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I asked Greg to start because I knew he was going to touch on this, but the competitive quoting option, um, we do always, always, always um, want to let you know that we are open to receiving competitive quotes and either looking to beat or match those. So that's something that we are, you know, we want to do whatever we can to own or earn your business, excuse me. Oh, so. Okay. <laughs> own your business and earn it yes <laughs> so um yeah so we, we do want to obviously stay competitive no matter what the origin is and Greg like like I did say um before we do primarily have our largest portion of our network in the U.S. in domestically but we do have international partners as well which you know those can compete amongst each other so um but we do like to stay competitive in total okay Thank you guys. So let's do two more questions before we close it out. And remember, all of your questions will get answered. Yes. Um, yes. If, if you have if you have more questions, please write them down because Kira and I are going to go through these uh, in the next couple of days and get back to any of these. So if you do have questions, mm -hmm. even right now, please write them down. We'll get back to you. And you can reach out um, through the via email. Their emails are right there on the screen as well. Okay. So uh, does Zometry do silicone injection molding? Kara, what's the latest on this one? <laughs> so um, this is somewhere that we're looking to increase our network as well. We do currently have a, um, some, P, uh, I guess you could say, partners in our network that are capable, um, although it is not a strong suit for us at this time. But we do um, focus on similar or like materials, such as a uh, elastomeric material we do offer, like a Santa Prina or a TPE or anything of that nature. Um, so we, we do offer similarities, although we are strengthening our network in LSR. Yeah, yeah. So stay, stay tuned. Uh, it's something that we, if you do have a project and you want us to explore it, uh, please feel free to submit it. We'll take a look. Yeah. And the last one here um, kind of covers a lot of these other questions, right? It's not, is pre-sale engineering free? Is a consultation free? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. All you have to do is submit your quote for manual review. Um, myself, along with the account representative, will probably be in touch. And like I said, we do offer um, guidance and um, recommendations on your design, and that is all free. Although I will say that we don't do um, any of the design work ourselves, so we leave that up to the customer just for liability reasons. We don't want to make any of those big decisions, but we, we offer free consultation. I guess you could say yes. <laughs> okay, great. So with that said, um, all of your specific questions will get answered during consultation. So that's it for us. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for joining our webinar on injection molding design strategies. Um, we look forward to consulting on your quotes. And um, also, don't forget to mention your coupon code. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.